Good morning. Today on Spotlight, an important update on the future of voting districts in the Great Lakes State and what you can do to have input in the entire process. We'll talk to two of the 13 member Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. Our guest, Brittany Kellum, a Democrat from Detroit, and Rebecca Zatella, an independent from Ann Arbor, not affiliated with either one of the major political parties. We'll also talk to Edward Woods III, Communications and Outreach Director for the Commission. And later on our Sunday morning program, you'll want to stick around to meet Yolanda Scarborough, lead trainer of the Youth Development Resource Center and founder of Camp Dinner Table. She has the adult secret to keeping Southeast Michigan's children active and happy all summer long. It's Sunday, June the 20th. I'm Chuck Stokes and this is Spotlight. Guests, thanks for joining me today on Spotlight. Real quick question to all three of you because you have been crisscrossing this state for several months now. Uh, it's the easiest question you're gonna get today. What's the prettiest part of this state? Brittany, you first. Well, of course, Detroit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting all these safe <laughs> answers. Rebecca, the prettiest part of the state. I, I loved Marquette. Marquette, okay. Yeah. Edward? I would say the whole entire state because it's full of Michigan residents. Okay, now that would be the communications and outreach director. <laughs> Just lump them all in there. Okay, I don't have time to really press you. Um, public <laughs> hearings for uh, the redistricting commission and for the people to be able to weigh in. You've had several of them. You just completed two in the city of Detroit. You have, I believe, four more coming up uh, in Port Huron, uh, Warren, Muskegon, and Grand Rapids, so people still have time to get to them. I'm gonna start with you, Brittany. What did you hear in Detroit? What was the message from the people? Well, in Detroit, I heard um, a very passionate voice that's yearning for change and the sense that um, this, this, this commission is something new and they want to trust, they want to believe, they want to have a, an experience of change that will leave them not feeling disenfranchised. Um, something that stuck out to me specifically as a, a citizen stood up and said that um, they're tired of begging for things that they deserve and that they have a right to have. And so in this redistricting process, especially as a native Detroiter, um, and it's not favoritism to any other part, but I wanna make sure that we take into account what we've heard, the pulse and the passion in the stories of Detroit red, uh, residents because they're ready for something different. They're ready to get rid of that gerrymandering and they really um, are supportive and, and believe that we as a commission can do something that is different. All right, Rebecca, what are you hearing uh, in the different communities that you've been in that has really stuck with you? Well, I just think there's an overwhelming theme of hope that people have hope and belief in this process that they're elated to be able to participate in it and just really um, the desire and the wish that we're going to comply with the voters wishes and come up with fair and transparent maps and so that sort of resonated every place we've been is just that feeling of of hope and and people are really placing um, their belief in us and and hoping that we will honor their wishes sure edward woods the third you get to worry about the whole big picture in a sense as communications and outreach director. Um, you've got four more hearings coming up. Um, how much do you try to get across to the public that they really do have input in this process, whether it's virtual or it's in person, um, and they can even submit their own maps, correct? Absolutely. Um, one of the things, you know, thanks to our partnership with Michigan 211, we were concerned about the digital divide. And we formed a partnership letting them know that if you want to provide comments directly during a public hearing, it doesn't have to be in a place where you live. If you call 211, they can register you. And for all of our remote comments, you have to register by noon, the day of the public hearing, and you can provide comments. As you mentioned, we're in Port Huron, we're in Warren, then the following Muskegon and Grand Rapids. It doesn't matter where you live in the state of Michigan. You can call 211 and register to provide remote comments 
whether it's virtual through Zoom or on the telephone to the commission. That is something we did. This commission is made up of 13 people, four who lean Democrat, four who lean Republican, five who say that they're not affiliated with either major political party. Um, we have part of that represented here today. Uh, Brittany, uh, you lean Democrat. Uh, Rebecca, uh, you're not affiliated with any major political party. Uh, we had hoped to have Cynthia Orton, who leans Republican, on the commission um, here today. Family emergency came up, and so she's not able to be with us. But Edward, um, because you have to work with all of them, how much is trust coming up, not among the commissioners so much, but in terms of the people? How much are they trusting this process that it is truly independent and not influenced by the big parties and the big wigs? Um, you know, we have to earn trust. Our trust is earned every week. Um, all of our meetings have been done in an open and transparent manner and live stream from the randomly selected commissioners that you mentioned earlier to every meeting that the commission has held to every subcommittee meeting that the commission has held. It is all has all been done live stream. We are an open book. We are a true reflection of high school civics when it comes to government for the people, by the people, and you can actually witness it taking place. There's no lobbying efforts that can be done by the commission. All of the commission's business must follow the open meetings. That we'll come right back. I'll pick up with uh, Brittany and Rebecca. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The census was supposed to be playing a big role in all of this. We know that census data has gotten delayed getting to all of you. What's the latest? Bring us up to date. Do you have everything you need yet? If not, when is it coming? And is it hindering you in getting to the finish line? So the census data is delayed um, a bit. We are expecting legacy data in the very beginning of August, which will enable us to start doing some work. And then we're expecting the full data set later in September. Um, we have asked and petitioned the Supreme Court to allow us an extension on our deadlines. And we actually have a hearing on that coming up on Monday, which will give us a little bit more time to incorporate that census data into our map drawing. And um, we're just waiting to hear from the Supreme Court as to whether they're gonna grant that relief. And then in the meantime, we're continuing working towards the goal of gathering information and starting to think about how we're gonna draw the maps that we need to draw what while do you we're think, waiting for the Supreme Court. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What do you, if you're a betting person, what do you think the chances are you're going to get that extension from the Michigan Supreme Court? Um, I honestly, as a background as a lawyer, I just, I, I don't know that I would be betting either way. <laughs> I just okay. think we've got to wait and see what they decide. I mean, it would be wonderful if they'd grant us that extension. And if they don't, then we're going to do our best to get the maps done in the, the time frames that are specified for us. So, sure. Brittany, if that extension is not given, um, does it hamper and perhaps even increase the chances that you cannot get to all the data you need to get to to be able to protect what you all have all been talking about, this communities of interest? Now, does it make our already tough job more challenging? Of course. But I think it's something that as a commission, the 13 of us will um, get through and def definitely use our resources to make sure it happens to the best of our ab ability while maintaining our vision and mission to be transparent, just and fair. All indications are that we're going to lose a congressional seat. Do you both agree with that? And if so, where do you think that's going to come from? Rebecca? Um. I don't know that I would say I agree or disagree with it. The numbers are what the numbers are. So that's what we've got to, um, to live with is that there is going to be a reduction in the seat. I don't know at this point that I have a specific contemplation as to, to where those numbers are going to come from. I think we're still gathering information and listening at this point. And then as a commission, we're going to have to decide how to reallocate that population into 13 districts instead of 14. Brittany, uh, if it comes down to uh, when the lines have been drawn, that it's going to be one district basically representing the city of Detroit, one representative, um, is that going to be something that the people of Detroit and surrounding areas can live with? 
I'm not sure. I don't have a pulse. Um, I think it would be unfair for me to represent all the citizens of Detroit, but I hope that um, the way that we draw with their input, the other districts and making sure that we've taken, to, taken into account what we've heard in terms of what's sacred to folks and what they would like to see what, what the individual ideas of fairness that um, when we get down to that one representative that it's done so in a way where there's still hope, trust and empowerment. Sure. Uh, Edward, we had hoped to have uh, Cynthia, as I mentioned earlier, who's from Battle Creek area on the, on the show, Cynthia Orton. Um, you've, though, been on the west side of the state. What is it they're saying on that side of the state? What is it that they're fighting for that they feel would be fair in representation for Grand Rapids, Muskegon, Battle Creeks? Well, we have go to uh, Muskegon until June 29th, and we don't go to Grand Rapids till July 1. But what we've heard from in Kalamazoo and Battle Creek um, area, when we're at the Kalamazoo, there's a concern as to whether Kalamazoo and Battle Creek should be together or should um, Battle Creek continue to be associated with Grand Rapids. We need to get to another quick little pause for the cost. We'll come right back with a final second. This initiative started in 2018, became a constitutional amendment, received overwhelming support from the people of Michigan saying they want to change the process and make it much more independent and take it out of the hands of the politicians. Um, you're going through all of this very deliberative process. We are watching the Michigan legislature and various legislatures across the nation change many of the voting rules and regulations. Do you all feel as though the work that you're doing is being undercut by your own legislature, even though you've heard from the people in terms of the process that they want? Uh, Brittany? I don't, I am hopeful and excited. Because we're hearing words like Jim Crow and all sorts of other things. Yeah, and I, and I think that is to be expected when you're doing something new, right? And there is a little um, suspicion and hesitancy if I want to give it a gentler term, and that's okay. That's okay. I think that's what's supposed to happen, but I think we have the job which we are doing, and um, not just because I'm in a commission, but I can stand by and say that we, uh, we are truly upholding the fact that we are doing the work correctly, correctly meaning we... We have no other agenda. We truly are 13 independent folks who are very intentional about adding to this process and making it democratic in terms of fairness. So um, I'm, I'm okay with those, those concerns and it just speaks to the fact that we're going to do a, a job that is done with integrity. You know, I'm not concerned. And the reason why I'm not concerned is because the, the work that we're doing in our job is actually enshrined in the Michigan constitution at this point. And that constitution mm -hmm. is protecting the role that we're doing, protecting our unique role of being the sole entity responsible for drawing district lines and district maps. And um, I, I take reassurance in knowing that the constitution is protecting our commission and protecting our very, very important role of creating these fair, balanced and transparent maps. You expect to get sued at the end of this process, correct? Well, absolutely. You know, you can never make any, anyone happy. But let's be clear, more than 61% of Michigan voters made an intentional and deliberate effort to say, we want citizens like us, independent. We don't, we don't want this partisanship. We want citizens like us who can make common sense decisions, will listen to our feedback, one, but not only listen to our feedback, but draw fair maps. Our two commissioners have stated that so clearly, so passionately, and we can't get afford to get up into this partisanship trap about this and that. We have one job, adopt fair maps, 13 congressional, 38 Senate, and 110 House. No one else has that authority. They don't have it. They've sued and they've lost. You can provide comments at www.michigan.gov forward slash M-I-C-R-C about your community of interest, about your Senate district, your House district, and your congressional district for the commission's consideration. 
keep in touch with us on this process. We know that you aren't quite at the finish line yet, but you're getting closer and closer. And when Spotlight returns, we'll talk to Yolanda Scarborough of the Youth Development Resource Center. I talked with her a few days ago. She gave me great tips on how to keep your kids busy all summer long. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Yolanda Scarborough of the Youth Development Center. Thank you for joining us today on Spotlight. Uh, quick question. Uh, it's a short little phrase, but discover your spark. Yes. What yes. is that? Sure. So Discover Your Spark is an initiative by the United Way. Um, we have partnered with several other organizations and the Youth Development Resource Center here in Detroit um, with summer programs. So if you are looking for a summer program for your young person um, from pre-K all the way up to 12th grade, the discoveryourspark.org website can help you do that. All right. And I understand you have close to 100 different programs that parents can access um, yeah. or caregivers to be able to find out information for their young Absolutely. person to keep them involved this summer? Absolutely. There's so many ways you can do it. You can go to the website and you can go into the search and you can type certain things in. Um, you can look up programs such as STEM. You can look up cooking, whatever your interests are. There's even academic things that you can look up for the summer. So it is a website platform, discoveryourspark.org. Um, you go onto the site and put information in that will help you find programs to help your child discover their interest for the summer. So say your child maybe is interested in music for the summer, go put that in there, put the age group in, and all programs that are applicable um, to what you're looking for will pop up and generate for you. Great, you're based in Detroit, uh, the Youth Development Center, but the programs on there are throughout the metro area? Absolutely, um, there's everything from virtual um, to some face-to-face, -face, as well as hybrid, grid, which is a mix of both. Uh, you're the founder of Camp Dinner Table. Yes, yes. What in the world so is that? <laughs> it it sure. sounds intriguing. <laughs> it's one of those programs that you can find on discoveryourspark.org. This is a cooking program that I started probably about a year ago. Actually, last week was our year anniversary. The program aims to bring families back to the dinner table and cook together and build community together as families. And the great thing about it, my program was featured on Discover Your Spark about a year ago. And thankfully, the parents could find me there. We've served over 551 students in a, a year's time. And a lot of those parents found me right on that platform. So again, um, it's Camp Dinner Table, a program where you can come cook together, build community together, just kind of bring us back to the olden days of when we all used to sit together and eat together and commune together and have conversations together. Seventy percent of meals consumed are outside of the home. Absolutely. Is that right? It's absolutely correct. Um, and I actually think the research that I was looking at through Harvard is like above 70 percent. They are consumed outside of the home. So Camp Dinner Table doesn't judge you with that because that's the life that some of us are living right now. But what if we could build community in the car? What if there's certain conversations and questions that we can have when your dinner table has to be McDonald's drive through It's quite possible to still build community, to still build those strong bonds together as a family. So yes, that stat is absolutely correct. And Camp Dinner Table aims to bring that down with the hopes that families can just take the time to eat together. A lot of times we don't even realize this happens. A lot of times we don't even realize we've taken that time to we're eating in the car, but we're not talking. The most that we're saying is, hey, what do you want on that burger? So there's a way where Camp Dinner Table asks, actually gives questions to the families. Um, one of the questions might be, how was school today? And we don't take an okay answer. I teach the parents how to continue the conversation on with the student so they can bring real conversation um, to the dinner table, whether that dinner table is in the car or whether that dinner table is actually at a dinner table. There are also great nutritional benefits as a result of this? Oh, yes. So one of the stats also coming out of Harvard is that students who eat at the dinner table are less likely to be picky eaters. They're less likely to be obese. They're less likely to 
um, not want to try new foods because they're cooking with you. And a lot of times, even if it's a food that you don't like, if you're cooking it in the kitchen and you're cooking it with your parents, you know, you're uh, more likely to want to try that particular food. Yeah, you know, I just think about how much lifestyles have changed. I know when I was a kid uh, to go to McDonald's or yes. uh, some other fast food place that was maybe on a Friday evening or maybe exactly. on a Saturday afternoon is a big treat. Uh, but it certainly was not a Monday through Thursday type of dinner. And I look at the lines now when I drive yep. and I see them wrapped around buildings for the fast food changes. I mean, lifestyles have really just changed and, and it's having and implications. Right. And there's no, of course, it has implications to our health, um, especially as black and brown people. You know, there, a lot of the foods are high sodium. A lot of the foods are high fat. When you cook at home, I actually, it's funny that you would bring up McDonald's. I actually made a McDonald's burger with a class last year. It tasted exactly like the McDonald's burger. It was a copycat recipe, but we knew where the meat came from. We knew where the cheese came from. We knew where that fresh bun came from. So there's no judgments to eating out periodically. But when you cook together, you control what is in your food and the preservatives, you control all of that. Why does there have to be preservatives if, if I'm eating this meal right away? Sure, let me take you back to uh, Discover Your Spark for yes. a moment. Um, yes. uh, what effect has COVID-19 had on that? And I understand that you've gotten some good corporate sponsors for that. Absolutely, um, we have um, Skillman, we have um, quite a bit of the United Way, who is the program has sponsored it. United Way has sponsored the Discover Your Spark program. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, COVID has played a part. Ralph Wilson Foundation, <laughs> I think, is involved Ralph in Ralph Wilson Foundation as well. We never thought that we were gonna be at a place where some of our summer programs are gonna have to be right in our home. So last year, Discover Your Spark, and this year as well, we were able to give you um, information about programs you could do right in your living room with your young people. So COVID has absolutely 100% played a part. Also in coming back to programming and getting back to face-to-face, -face, there's now certain things that we have to do when we get back to face-to-face. -to -face. We still have to make sure the students are social distancing. We still have to make sure that safety is our number one priority even when we're coming back together. All right. Yolanda Scarborough, thank you for all this great information. I know that parents are probably just sucking it up right now and they're busy on those computers. We've put the website up on the screen, so hopefully they will access it and hopefully uh, you'll get a lot of response. Thank you so okay. much for joining us thank and you. best thank of luck you. to you. Have a great, great summer. Thank you. Do the same. Bye bye. Yeah, bye, -bye. Thanks to all of my guests today. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.